tonight we're going to go over, for the first half, we're going to go over the neurological exam, which is something that I've done before if you've been to one of my talks. But I thought it's a really important thing for all neurologic cases. Um, the neurologic exam can tell us a lot. So making sure you have a, a good understanding of it and um, then being able to localize your lesion is really important before even considering talking about differentials. And then the second half of the talk, we're going to go over some actual cases. So we don't need any fancy equipment to do the neurologic exam. You need a good light source, a bright light source, a reflex hammer, some hemostats, and then ideally a non-slip surface. We use a yoga mat on our exam tables to help with that. That's pretty cheap. Um, throughout the hospital, the floors are a little bit slick, so we'll often take animals outside so they have a better surface to walk on. Um, or we'll take them into our rehab room has um, good traction on the floor. The things you're going to assess for the neurology exam will include the mentation, the head and neck posture, cranial nerves, the gait, our postural reactions, our proprioception, reflexes, paniculus, and then palpation. Is this animal painful? When describing the gait, if an animal is weak in the rear legs, call that paraparesis. If they have no visible voluntary motor, that's paraplegia. So anytime you say para, that's referring just to the rear legs. If it's one-sided, so front and back legs on the same side, then that would be hemiparesis or plegia. And then if it's one leg, it'd be mono. And if it's all four, then you can call it quadra or tetraparesis or plegia. Either, either term is appropriate. And then the other distinction is trying to determine between ataxia and paresis. Animals can be ataxic but not be weak, which is what paresis implies. And we can also have animals that are paretic but not ataxic. And that's important to try to distinguish between because different diseases will sometimes cause just one of those and not the other. So I like to have all of my patients in a room where I can let them off leash so they can walk around. If you're, you know, the owner's holding them or you just are looking at them on the exam table or you're walking them up and down the hallway on a leash, it's really hard to appreciate a lot of things. And just having them loose in the exam room, even if it's just while you're getting a history from the owner or talking, um, you can learn a lot. Ideally, I think it should be done away from the owner because I think they act different when they're away from the owner. But just walking and see, or watching this animal and seeing, are they interested in their surroundings? Do they respond to you? Are they bumping into things? Are they walking in circles? Are they off balance? And then cranial nerves are typically next. I try to do things in the same order every time so I don't leave something out. With cranial nerves, you want to assess the menace in each eye individually while the other eye is covered. Check the pupil size before you check their PLR to see if before you do that, are they equal in size? And then do they both respond um, the same to light? A lot of animals are scared when they're in the hospital, so they might have an incomplete PLR. Um, but as long as there's some response and the pupils are equal in size, then I usually consider that normal. And then I check for facial sensation and check for physiologic nystagmus by moving their head side to side. Or if it's a small animal, you can just kind of pick them up and turn them in a circle while you watch their eyes and make sure they have that normal doll's eye movement. And then we'll always check for pathologic nystagmus um, by laying them on their right and left side and then in dorsal recumbency. I usually do that as part of the reflexes so we don't have to lay them down separate times. Um, when you're turning their head side to side, they should have um, that sort of ticking motion with their eyes. Um, it's pretty rare to come across a, an animal with no physiologic nystagmus, but if you have a bilateral vestibular lesion, which then would make them not have a head tilt, they sometimes won't have physiologic or pathologic nystagmus. For proprioception, there's a few different things you can do. Um, doing the what's called proprioceptive positioning or knuckling is something that we do in pretty much every animal and that's done with each leg individually while you're supporting their weight. I usually with a small dog of this size I would do it up on the table 
but sometimes I find animals react different when they're on the table and if they're kind of slow or sluggish when I'm doing this and I don't that doesn't quite fit with what I'm seeing otherwise I'll, I'll repeat it on the floor sometimes I think they're scared on the table and just behaviorally they might be a little slow in small dogs you can also do hopping which is done on each leg individually and you hop them laterally while you try to put most of their weight over that leg that you're testing and you can do that for the front and the back legs for big dogs where you may not be able to pick them up and do each individual leg you can do hemi walking which I don't think I did in this dog um, where you'd pick up the legs on one side of the body and push them over to the other side and then for reflexes I try to keep it simple I basically test withdrawal in all four legs and then a patellar reflex I don't do triceps biceps cranial tibial all that other stuff um, mainly because they can be unreliable and sometimes hard to elicit in normal patients and they don't really add a whole lot to the exam so the, the biggest thing you're trying to get from the reflexes is are the reflexes there or not I don't get hung up on is this reflex a little hyper as long as it seems like it's present then usually you're not dealing with a lower motor neuron type disease which would mean something peripheral like a peripheral neuropathy or something in the reflex arc which would be C6 to T2 if you have depressed reflexes in the front or L4 to S2 if it's depressed reflexes in the rear so you'll do your reflexes with the animal and lateral recumbency normally I'd assess tone so flex the leg and then in the back leg again I just do a patellar reflex and a withdrawal sometimes if the animal is really tense it can be hard to elicit the patellar reflex or sometimes it'll even be hyper and one thing you can try is if you can't get a reflex when the leg is up test it when the leg is down it's usually more relaxed so as long as you can get a reflex even if you can't get it when the legs up if you get it when that legs down then I would still count it as being present and then in the forelimb I I just do a withdrawal and that's assessing pretty much all the nerves of the brachial plexus once you've done the neuro exam then the next step is to localize the lesion so before we start talking about differentials you want to <clears throat> be able to take what you've found on your exam and say this is where the lesion is we break it down to to these locations is it intracranial and if it's intracranial usually there's there's pretty different signs when it comes to a forebrain lesion meaning something in the cerebrum or the thalamus versus something in the brain stem or cerebellum if it's not intracranial you think it's something involving the spinal cord then you want to try to localize it to either an upper cervical lesion a lower cervical lesion a T TL lesion or more of a lumbosacral lesion and then also don't forget sometimes a lesion doesn't fit into one of those categories we might be dealing with something involving the peripheral nervous system so we could be dealing with a, a muscle disorder a primary nerve disorder or something involving the neuromuscular junction and then we can see multifocal lesions I always try to make everything fit with one lesion location. most of the time that's what we're dealing with but sometimes we are truly dealing with something that's multifocal and it doesn't fit in one spot when it comes to the forebrain one of the hallmarks is an animal that has a mentation change they may be dulled they may be demented but typically these animals are going to have a normal gait these animals are not significantly ataxic or paretic but they may be circling they may be pacing they can have visual deficits but no other cranial nerves are going to be affected if we're truly dealing with a forebrain lesion this is an example of a cat that had a right-sided forebrain lesion you can see this cat is pacing he occasionally circles to the right side which they usually are going to circle towards the side of the lesion but this animal is not significantly ataxic on neuro exam we would expect him to have proprioceptive deficits on the left side so the proprioceptive deficits are going to be contralateral to your lesion he could potentially have a visual deficit also on the opposite side but no other cranial nerves should be affected this is an example of a dog with a right forebrain lesion so they they can have big circles or little circles uh, it's really variable 
But you can see this dog is obviously circling. He's not, I would not call him significantly ataxic. He doesn't have a head tilt versus we'll see one in a little bit that looks very similar to this, but it's just some, some slight differences. And then this is a, an interesting syndrome that it's pretty rare, but sometimes seen with forebrain lesions where animals will basically ignore everything on the side opposite their lesion. So this dog would, the owners filmed this at home, only eat, he had a, um, a left-sided lesion and he ignored everything on the right side. If you touch this dog on the right side of the face, he acted like he didn't feel it. It wasn't that he didn't have facial sensation, he just didn't have any response. If you turn, after he ate out of the left side of the bowl, if you turned it around, then he would eat out of the other side. But otherwise, they basically don't recognize stuff on the opposite side of the lesion. So to have that, that degree of asymmetry is, is pretty unusual, but you can see that with a forebrain lesion. When we're dealing with lesions in the brainstem, this is when you're going to see significant ataxia or paresis that affects all four legs. And you also, this is where the majority of your cranial nerves from, come from. Cranial nerves 3 through 12 originate from the brainstem. <clears throat> so any of these can be affected depending where in the brainstem your lesion is. This little dog looks similar to the other one that we saw circling, other than this one's going to the, to the left, which with the brainstem, if they're circling, it's also usually towards the side of the lesion. The difference is this dog, as you can see, is more ataxic, he's stumbling, and he has a, a definite head tilt. Pure cerebellar lesions are not super common. Um, there's often... When we're dealing with a lesion in the cerebellum, there's often some brainstem involvement. They're so closely associated, but if you had a pure cerebellar lesion, things you might see are ataxia, but without weakness. So there's no loss of strength, but these animals can be significantly ataxic. Sometimes it can be a little hard to tell um, that they're not weak. They are gonna have normal reflexes. Depending on what part of the cerebellum is affected, you may or may not see obvious vestibular signs. So they may not have a head tilt, they may not have nystagmus, but the ataxia and the hypermetria and dysmetria are, are the, the hallmarks of this. They will sometimes have a menace deficit, although their vision is normal. And that will usually be on the side of the lesion, if it's an asymmetrical lesion. This is a dog with a congenital cerebellar lesion, so it was a pure cerebellar lesion. It doesn't have proprioceptive deficits, it just has this really pronounced, what I'd call a dysmetria or hypermetria. And then this little dog, if you'll pay attention to her left front leg, you can see the pronounced hypermetria. She's really excited about her treat. <laughs> And then I wanted to talk about vestibular disease a little bit separately because it, I think, is confusing a lot of times. Though the hallmarks of vestibular disease are going to include a head tilt. These animals usually will have a corresponding strabismus in that, the, the side of the head tilt. They may have pathologic nystagmus. They're usually ataxic. They may lean or roll. These things tell you if you see them we have vestibular disease it does not tell you the etiology diagnosis so from there if you see these signs you know we're dealing with the vestibular lesion the next thing to try to figure out is is this lesion central or peripheral by central meaning we're dealing with a problem in the brainstem usually the caudal brainstem where the vestibular nuclei are located because of the location of the lesion, there's a lot of other cranial nerves nearby. You may see other cranial nerve deficits. Their mentation may be affected, so these animals can be dull or depressed. And they, not always, but one of the, the hallmarks is they may have proprioceptive deficits, which will be on the same side as the lesion. If there is vertical nystagmus, that's another big clue that this is a central lesion and not something peripheral. Although if you see rotary or horizontal, that does not distinguish between one or the other. With peripheral disease, I'd say one of the big hallmarks is Horner's. If you have an animal come in that has a concurrent Horner's, that is rarely ever a central lesion. That usually indicates a, a peripheral lesion.
And these animals, again, are very ataxic if it's peripheral, but they should not be paretic or have proprioceptive deficits. They may also have a concurrent cranial nerve 7 deficit. By looking at this dog, we can see he's ataxic, he stumbles to the right, he's got a right-sided head tilt. So we know this dog has a vestibular condition. Until you do more of the exam, you can't tell is this central or peripheral just by looking at him. But you can tell immediately this dog has some sort of vestibular dysfunction. If they're really ataxic, it can be very difficult to do proprioception in these guys. But in a dog like this that's able to stand up, he's not rolling, it's, it's pretty easy to do. And this dog did not have any repeatable deficits. And then a subset of central vestibular disease is going to be paradoxical vestibular disease. We can see this when there's a lesion in a very specific part of the cerebellum where it's called paradoxical because your head tilt is going to be on the side opposite of your lesion. So if you, look, if you look at this dog, you're going to really appreciate the hypermetria in the right front leg. And that tells us there's probably some cerebellar involvement, but yet the hypermetria is on one side and the head tilts to the other. So this is a, an example of where you can just look at this dog and tell this dog has to have a lesion in the brainstem or cerebellum. This is not going to be a peripheral lesion when you see this. All right, we're moving on to the spinal cord. And again, if anyone has questions, please interrupt me. When we're dealing with a lesion in the upper cervical spinal cord, we are going to have normal reflexes or hyperreflexes in all limbs. But the most important thing is that you should have reflexes in all of your limbs. Depending on what the cause is, they may or may not be painful. You can see a Horner's with a lesion in the upper cervical spine on the side of the lesion. And you may have proprioceptive deficits in all four or potentially lateralized on just one side, depending on the lesion. So I would call this dog non-ambulatory quadriparetic. He's got voluntary motor, much better on the left side than the right. But this dog cannot walk without assistance. If you hold him up, you can see the motor. He's got pretty significant proprioceptive deficits on the right side, but actually is pretty good in that left front. So just by looking at this dog, you couldn't necessarily tell just from this part that this is a C1, C5 lesion. But we know, looking at him, all four legs are affected. We have to be dealing with something cervical or higher. There's no, the mentation's normal. There's no cranial nerve deficits. And then if you have normal reflexes in the limbs, then you'd be able to localize it to C1 to C5. When we're dealing with lesions in the caudal cervical or upper thoracic spine, the hallmark of this is going to be usually a two-engine gait. This is where they have a real short and choppy gait in the forelimbs, and they're ataxic in the rear. So these dogs often come in with an owner complaint of just rear limb weakness or ataxia. They don't often, I'd say most owners often, don't appreciate the forelimb signs. They may have proprioceptive deficits in all four or again one-sided, although a lot of these dogs won't have proprioceptive deficits in the forelimbs, they'll just have it in the rear. And the way you can appreciate that this lesion is actually cervical is how short and choppy they are in the front or having decreased withdrawal in the forelimbs. You can also get a, a Horner's with a lesion here as well. So this is a classic example of a, a wobbler doby. So these guys, again, often don't have proprioceptive deficits in the forelimbs unless it's a really severe lesion. And they, it'll often just be in the rear. But this dog's got a good withdrawal in the rear. And then what you'll see is in the forelimb, he can feel it, but he does not, he's not able to pull the limb back. Yeah, oftentimes when they can't pull the limb back, what you'll see is they'll kind of kick the leg backwards like that at you. Because he feels it, but he can't completely flex the limb. Here's another one that I think is a little bit more pronounced. You can see how short and choppy he is in the forelimbs. And he's got these longer strides in the rear. So the two engine gates, you know, the forelimbs and the rear limbs are, are kind of functioning at very different paces. For lesions in the T3-L3 spine, 
These animals should have normal forelimb gait and normal proprioception in the forelimbs. And depending on the type of lesion, how severe it is, they may be paraparetic or paraplegic. Lesions in this area can also cause shift Sherrington posture, where if they're laying on their side, they have really increased extensor tone in the forelimbs. Sometimes it can be a little confusing when they come in um, if they are recumbent and you see that. And one way to know it's not a cervical lesion, if you get these animals up and you wheelbarrow them, they should be normal in the forelimbs. Versus if it's a cervical lesion causing that, when you go to get them up and wheelbarrow them, they should have some deficits in the forelimbs. We also can see with these fecal incontinence, and that's something that I, I see a lot of patients, I don't want to say a lot, I see patients come in that have had reports of fecal incontinence, and so when they come in to me, they're often coming in with the report of, you know, suspect lumbosacral lesion or something in the L4, S2 spine. And a lot of these guys, they have, but they have normal anal tone. So we can see fecal incontinence with lesions higher up in the spinal cord, specifically if the lesion's affecting the dorsal part of the spinal cord. So it's not super common to see this with something like disc disease, um, but I see this in more um, dogs that have things on the dorsal part of the cord, which the two main things we would see there would either be a tumor or a cyst. So depending on the dog, if it's a young dog, then it's more likely to be a cyst. If it's an older dog, then, and I see fecal incontinence, but it's suspected to have a T3, L3 lesion, then I start worrying about things like tumors. Here's our classic T3, L3 dachshund. So a lot of these guys can't walk, but if you get them up and support them, or you, know, you can see a little bit of motor present in the rear legs, sometimes you can see a lot more than what you would expect. I'll often walk these guys by just supporting them with their tail. If it's a big dog, you can get them up with a sling or a towel or something under their abdomen so you can see how much motor they have. So this guy had really good tone in the rear legs, but he's got absent proprioception, and then his forelimbs are normal. Although it can be tough in some of these animals, if they can't support any weight on the rear legs, to test proprioception in the front if you're having to hold them up in the back. So you can hop them would be sometimes more reliable. So again, I don't get hung up on is this, le is this reflex hyper or is it normal? We're just trying to make sure that it's present and it's not absent or severely depressed. And when you're testing withdrawal, if the animal has visible voluntary motor, I'm usually not trying to determine if they have deep pain. If they have motor, they should have deep pain. If they don't have motor, then that's when you want to, while you're testing withdrawal, you want to check and see, are they feeling it? So by pulling the leg back, that doesn't mean they can feel it. You want to see a visible reaction from them. They squeal or they turn around and try to bite you. With lesions in the caudal lumbar spine to sacral spine, we can still get paraparesis and occasionally paraplegia if the lesion's more towards L4. But the further caudal you go in the spine, the less likely you are to actually see significant motor deficits. We would never see paralysis from a, a lesion L6 to L7 or caudal. Their spinal cord is already tapering off by that point, so you can certainly see some weakness. You might see lameness more likely, but you're not going to see paralysis with a lesion that far caudal in the spine. If the lesion's more towards L4, L6, you might have a depressed patellar reflex, and then if it's further caudal, you might have a decreased withdrawal. And these are also the animals that can um, have decreased or absent anal tone. This dog is a little hard to appreciate just from this video, but this dog had a pretty classic gait for a dog with a caudal lumbar lesion. He had really decreased tone in the pelvic limbs. If you stood this dog up and you didn't support him at all, he could not hold any of his own weight. But yet if you held him up, he had good motor. So these guys will often not necessarily be completely knuckling or dragging. They might have decent motor, but they have really decreased tone. So they can't hold themselves up. All right, we're going to move on to the peripheral nervous system. Lesions here are not nearly as common as lesions affecting the spinal cord or even the brain. So you will see these much, much less often. 
Next, when you do, these animals are going to have a normal mentation. Some neuropathies can affect cranial nerves, so there, there can be some cranial nerve involvement. Specifically, say seven would be the most common one that you would see. And the hallmark of a peripheral neuropathy is usually decreased tone and um, depending on the degree of the neuropathy, you, know, you might have paralysis of the affected limbs. If we're dealing with something affecting one limb, then your top differentials are going to be either a traumatic lesion like a brachial plexus avulsion or neoplasia. When we have a neuropathy affecting all four limbs, then you have a pretty small list of things to choose from. So things like tick paralysis, botulism, some envenomations that we don't really see here can cause a generalized neuropathy. There are some drugs like fincristine that can cause a neuropathy. This is an example of a dog that had suspected botulism or coonhound paralysis where the dog had no reflexes in any of its limbs. He still had sensation. So if you have no reflexes in the front or the back limbs, you either have to give this dog a lesion in two locations. You'd have to give it a C6, T2, and then an L4, S2 lesion, which would be very unlikely. So your other option is this is a generalized neuropathy. And when it comes to that, like I said, there's very few rule outs. There are no real tests to do to try to distinguish is this botulism versus coonhound paralysis. Um, tick paralysis, paralysis can look the same. Um, you'd go looking for a tick on these animals. We, I would often, if I had a patient come in like this, you know, we certainly search for the tick. We often will put front line or something on them in case it's somewhere we just can't find. But that's a pretty rare thing. It's more common to see the coonhound paralysis or botulism. There's no treatment for, for either of those. It's just time and supportive care. And this is actually a little dog, so I never get to see this. I think this was only the second case I had actually seen of tick paralysis. We all, you know, want to think that this is what it is when they come in in their week, but it never really is. But this one actually was. Although this dog actually presented pretty differently than what I would expect. So this little dog looks ataxic. And most of the time with a neuropathy, they're not ataxic. They're really weak. But this dog was. We also saw, which is not included in this video, he had a facial nerve paralysis on one side. And he had depressed reflexes all over. So when I looked at this dog, you know, it didn't make sense. And then we started searching, and in his big poof ball of hair, we found the big tick. And we removed it, and then this is him the next day. So I was a little skeptical that that was what this was because of how ataxic he was, but he never came back. So <laughs> The next lesion location we're going to talk about is neuromuscular junction. And pretty much when we think of this, we're going to be really thinking about myasthenia gravis. And these animals, again, are, are not typically ataxic, just very weak. Their proprioception is usually normal, so that's another big clue that if you have this really weak animal that can't walk, but yet you stand them up and you test their proprioception, it's going to be normal. Unless they're in, which we'll talk about, there are some severe forms of myasthenia where they may have decreased proprioception. So this dog, I believe, actually came in through our surgery service for suspected, I can't remember, suspected cruciate disease. And this was kind of this dog at its worst. There, when he initially came in, he could walk some, and then it had progressed to this point where this dog wouldn't get up in the rear. So I looked at this dog and suspected this dog had myasthenia gravis. So we did a tensilon test on him, and this was him right after the injection. And you'll see in a minute that he starts to get weak again, so the tensilon doesn't last very long. And see him start to get stiff and, and weak in the rear. And we'll talk a little bit more about this during one of our cases. So myopathies can present a lot of different ways depending on the actual disease. Some of these animals will have really decreased muscle tone. Some of them can have increased muscle tone. Um, some of them result in muscle atrophy, whereas some 
myopathies actually cause muscle hypertrophy. The big thing again with these animals is they're usually not ataxic. Um, they may be weak, they may have a stiff gait, but they're not typically ataxic and proprioception is also typically normal. So these animals can be, if it's a generalized neuropathy or excuse me, myopathy, it can be hard to distinguish this from some orthopedic diseases or something like polyarthritis. This is a, a young German Shepherd that had an immune mediated polymyositis. So just walking or watching this dog walk, you know, one of my first thoughts would have been, is this a, like a polyarthropathy? He didn't have any joint effusion or joint pain. If you're suspicious of something like a generalized myopathy, a good thing to check would be a CPK and see if that's elevated. If you have, you know, not, not just a slightly high CK, but if you have a significantly elevated CK, you're always going to want to try to track down a muscle disorder, specifically if you can repeat it. If you see it, you're not sure what to make of it, you repeat it, it's still high, um, then we're going to be looking for some sort of myopathy. And this is a little dachshund that actually had a Cushing's myopathy, which is pretty rare, but sometimes doesn't show up in these guys until after they're actually on treatment. So it's not always in undiagnosed dogs. I've seen it in, it's not common, I've seen a few cases of it, but I've seen it in ones that were being treated for their Cushing's. Once they get to this point, there's usually no, no treatment for them. Take a guess what this myopathy is. So that's a myelopathy, this is a myopathy. So this is fibrotic myopathy, or um, sometimes it's called gracilis or semitendinosis myopathy. It's mainly seen in German Shepherds. There, I think 90% of the cases are seen in German Shepherds. Um, it can affect one or both rear legs, and it causes, you'll see when the dog, we kind of see him from behind, this pretty characteristic gait to where the toe kind of turns in, and they have this real shortened forward phase of the gait in that leg because the muscle is basically either the gracilis or the semitendinosis has fibrosed and contracted so they're unable to fully bring the leg forward so the leg kind of slaps down on the ground real quickly and that foot turns in so this is something that's diagnosed pretty much just based on watching these animals walk there's nothing you can do for it typically they're not painful though there is surgery that is kind of talked about, but you, I think most of the cases that are reported um, that have had surgery, the signs return within a few months of surgery. So it's more of a mechanical lameness. If this was seen in a working dog, you know, they may not be able to continue their job, but as far as a pet goes, I mean, it doesn't, they can still pretty much do most of their normal things. Do they uh, drag their toe down? No, they usually don't. So they usually don't scuff the foot. Something um, that probably I'd say a lot of you may not have heard of are movement disorders. So there's, there's probably a few that you may be familiar with. You just don't maybe know that they're called movement disorders. I'd say these are not um, super well characterized at this point in veterinary medicine. They can be very hard to distinguish from a seizure. So these are um, involuntary movements, usually repetitive movements that involve either maybe one limb or sometimes the whole body or even sometimes the head. It's thought that these usually are originating from problems within the basal ganglia, which is in the brain and helps control usually initiation of movement. This is where, with Parkinson's, where the lesion is. We don't really see that same thing occur in dogs with lesions in that area, but we can see other movement disorders occur. So these animals have a normal mentation. They're usually going to be normal on exam, and the only way we're usually going to realize what it is is if the owner can get a video or if they happen to do it in the clinic, which I think is pretty rare. There are some that are characterized in animals, as you can see. So Scotty Cramp may be one that you've heard of. The episodic head tremors, which we'll see in a minute, is now thought to be a movement disorder, although it's not been completely worked out as what actually causes this. Episodic falling in the Cavaliers is one. Um, and then there's these other breeds, 
where they can have what they call these paroxysmal dyskinesias, where they may have flexion of one or more limbs kind of randomly. These animals usually don't respond to treatment. Things that have been mentioned that you can try are things like clonazepam. You can try anticonvulsants. There's some sporadic reports of dogs with these that respond to anticonvulsants, but most of the time they don't. Although specifically with Scotty Cramp, we do know that that involves a defect in serotonin in the CNS, and so treatment for that is actually fluoxetine. This is a, a dog that I saw, I can't remember what his presenting complaint was, but he would have these episodes that usually happened when he got to his noise. So he was looking out the gate, and then I think he gets startled. So mentation-wise, you know, he was responsive, he never lost consciousness, but he would do this intermittently. And as you can see, even when he's walking, he looks abnormal. So we put this guy on some fluoxetine and he responded pretty quickly. I think this dog was on it for quite a while and then the owner herself started taking the dog off and then she called me and said he was starting to have episodes again. So we just put him back on it. And this is what we call episodic head tremors or idiopathic head tremors. I see a lot of um, videos that people send to me on this that um, you know, they want to know, is this a seizure? Is this a focal seizure? These guys may do the side to side or up and down head tremors, but if you can stop it, they'll usually respond to you. Their mentation's normal. And if you see it in one of these specific breeds, a Doberman, a Bulldog, or a Boxer, then you can feel pretty confident that that's what this is. It's not, there's no treatment for it. I wouldn't put these guys on anticonvulsants. It's not seizure activity. I think it bothers the owners probably more than it actually bothers the dog. All right, we're going to start with some cases. I might have to go a little fast so we can make it through all the cases, but if you have specific questions about any of these diseases, just stop me. This is a one-year-old female intact boxer mix that presented um, after the owners had gotten this dog and only had it for just a short period. They didn't know any of her history, so they brought her in. They Not here, they brought her into their primary veterinarian, she got vaccinated. I can't remember if she had blood work at that time or if it was afterwards. So shortly after that, the, they reported that the dog seemed lethargic, um, not wanting to do much. Between her regular vet and the ER here, she was seen a few times. And at one point was noted to have a temperature of 104.8. She did have blood work at one point, I can't remember exactly when in the course, but had an elevated white blood cell count and was treated with um, an inside, showed a slight improvement, but just wasn't back to normal. So I ended up seeing this dog, and on exam, the dog was mentally appropriate, responsive, but had low head carriage, just didn't seem to want to lift its head up in the room. Looked a little stiff when it was walking around, not ataxic, had normal proprioception, and this dog was painful with palpation of the caudal thoracic spine and also seemed painful moving its head around. So where would we localize this dog? This is one where I thought it probably seemed more cervical, but she, I did get some thoracic pain, so this may be multifocal. So then we come up with a list of differentials. And once we have our lesion localization, then our signalment, we usually can come up with a fairly short list of differentials depending on the history. So this being a really young dog, we had IVDD on our differential list. So a dog, any dog under a year of age or around a year of age, I've never seen IVDD if it wasn't due to some sort of traumatic um, event like being hit by a car. So other things though I would consider in a young dog like this would be something like discospondylitis, which can be multifocal. Um, neoplasia, even though this is a really young dog, there are certain cancers that we see in really young dogs, specifically things involving the nervous system. Meningitis was another top differential. And then polyarthritis or polymyositis were also differentials, though I could not find any specific joint pain on this dog. But these guys with polyarthritis sometimes can manifest with just spinal pain. They don't always have the joint signs initially. But because she came to me, and I'm a neurologist, I recommended a CSF tap. 
So a dog like this is a really good candidate for a spinal tap. If this dog had been six years old and came out with these same exact symptoms, I wouldn't necessarily jump to a spinal tap. So the chance of something like meningitis would be pretty low at that age and I'd be worried about other things. So when it comes to a spinal tap, the findings can be pretty nonspecific. There's very few diseases where we actually diagnose them with a spinal tap. So this is obviously a different dog, not the same one, but to do a spinal tap, we do place them under general anesthesia. If you're right-handed, you're gonna place them in right lateral recumbency. And then basically palpate the wings of C1 and the occipital protuberance and go in the middle. The occipital protuberance kind of tells you where your midline is, and then the wings of the atlas kind of give you an idea of you don't want to go further caudal than that. This dog had a very abnormal CSF. This is not the dog that I showed before, but normally we'll just let it drip out and collect it, usually into a non-additive tube, unless it's really bloody like this, then we put it in a, a purple top so it doesn't clot. So the one-year-old boxer mix that came in, the spinal tap came back, and that dog had, I don't know if you can read it, the dog had 800 white blood cells, which is really high. Normal is less than five. If you have a clean tap, it would be normally zero if it's a normal animal, and this animal had 800. So we know this dog has meningitis from this. Then the next question is, well, what kind is this? And on cytology, this dog had um, mainly just neutrophils as far as the white blood cells went. So our two big differentials for having neutrophils would be either a bacterial meningitis, which is extremely rare, or steroid responsive meningitis arteritis. So this is the most common type of meningitis in dogs. There are certain breeds it's seen in more often, like boxers and beagles. Weimariners, it's usually seen in dogs um, under two years of age. So again, rare to see this in an older dog. About, I'd say about half of these patients will have a fever, so half of them don't. So that's not always something you're gonna see. And they may or may not have an elevated white blood cell count, but the hallmark of this is gonna be typically neck pain and occasionally they'll have TL pain as well. They typically don't have significant um, paresis or proprioceptive deficits. They usually respond well to treatment, although treatment is a pretty long course of steroids. So these guys usually don't end up needing a secondary immunosuppressant. If you treat them long enough with steroids, the majority of dogs you can get off of steroids and they'll stay in permanent remission. You don't want to vaccinate these guys while they're undergoing treatment. Because a lot of these dogs are young dogs and they may be due for vaccines, so that's just something to remember. You don't want to vaccinate them. I recommend usually getting them completely off meds for several months without signs of relapse before getting vaccines. Then you can get heartworm or flea prevention, but just no vaccines while they're on this treatment. Remember they used to call beagle pain syndrome? Uh-huh, yeah. What about Spain, that dog? Could that person in the tap contributed to uh, any of that? Could her being intact? Uh -huh. No, I don't know that it was the vaccine that triggered it or if the dog already had this and that, you know, kind of pushed it over the edge. But I mean, I see, yeah, I mean, I've seen several of these where it seems like in a short period after getting vaccinated, they, they become clinical, but I've also seen ones where they haven't been vaccinated in, in you know, a year. We can't blame it on vaccines, so. Um, as I just like other autoimmune diseases, a lot of times we don't know what the trigger is and there may be some sort of genetic component to it since we do see it in certain breeds more than others. Most, I mean, most animals that we see are spayed or neutered that have this, so I don't think being intact had anything to do with it. I think this was just a dog that I think it had been living outside somewhere else and these people ended up taking this dog and they were trying to do the right thing and get this dog taken in and they and then she got all her vaccines and then shortly after came down with this. This is a five-year-old male neutered lab that presented for an acute onset of paraparesis. The owner was walking this dog outside on a leash like she always does. She takes she comes home at lunch, she takes this dog for a walk. There's an area where she lets it off leash at the end of the walk. So she said the dog seemed normal. It was running off leash. She heard a yelp and next thing looked over, the dog was dragging its back legs. So it came into us. There were no other 
previous problems reported. And you can see this dog is pretty much dragging that back left leg. Without assistance, this dog could not get up and walk on his own. But with assistance, he had good motor in that back right, and then his forelimbs were normal. This is his full neuro exam. So everything from the forelimbs up was, were, was normal. The dog had proprioceptive deficits in both rear limbs, um, much worse in the left than the right. This dog was not painful anywhere that I could find. And one thing that we'll talk about is he had a weak withdrawal in the left rear limb, which would tell us that we might want to consider more of a caudal lumbar lesion. Although based on what I suspected was wrong with this dog, I still suspected that his lesion was T3L3. So in lesion localization can be a little bit tricky in these guys. So I suspected it was T3L3, although again, the decreased withdrawal in the, the one rear limb felt like I couldn't completely rule out an L4S2 lesion. But differentials for this dog is, was pretty much FCE until proven otherwise. Um, certainly disc disease can do this. Um, the dog was not painful at all, though I have seen dogs that just didn't show any pain, so it was, it was still a rule out. And then neoplasia doesn't typically present this acutely, but it's always on our list of differentials. So we recommended an MRI to see what this was. And the dog's MRI, I don't know if you can see, he's got a slight bulging disc here, but this was not his lesion. Um, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's more obvious than this, but he's got this hyperintensity in his spinal cord. And then, you know, if you can tell um, over here, this is the left side. He's got this hyperintensity within the cord, which is suspected edema from an embolism. So we don't see the embolism itself on an MRI. We see the secondary effects. Had this dog had a CT scan, we wouldn't have seen anything. You would have basically been able to rule out a compressive lesion, but you won't see the changes in the cord. So MRI is definitely preferred for these. And this dog's lesion was, in fact, I think this was up around T12-13. When we, occasionally dogs don't follow the rule and when we have a really acute lesion in the T3-L3 spinal cord, they will sometimes have a decreased withdrawal in the rear limbs and it's thought to be due to spinal shock, um, which is a, this phenomenon where they'll, they'll get deficits caudal to the lesion for a short period. And specifically, it seems like it's seen with FCEs more than any other condition. So if I see a dog has a little bit of a decreased withdrawal in the rear, but everything else is kind of pointing towards an upper motor neuron lesion, then the big thing would just be making sure when you do something, whether that's radiographs or we did an MRI, that you know we look high enough up to find the lesion. So an FCE is not a blood clot. It's thought to be obstruction of blood flow due to fibrocartilage that gets into a blood vessel in the spinal cord. How exactly this happens is not completely known. It often seems to happen when the animal is playing or doing some sort of activity, but it can happen at rest as well. The hallmark of these are it's acute onset and they're not progressive, at least not past 24 hours and typically not past you know, an hour or two at most. Um, so if you have an animal that it's been progressing over two, three days, we can, we can rule this out. So these are gonna be very, very acute and onset, not progressive. Other than when they happen, the owner may report pain. There's usually no pain by the time the, the patient gets to you. They may be, um, they may affect any part of the spinal cord. So if it happens in the cervical spine, um, you may see all four legs affected or just one side. They're usually asymmetric. Um, if it's a really severe one, you could get, um, you know, and it happens in the thoracolumbar cord, you could have both rear legs affected equally. It's typically seen in big dogs. Um, the one small dog that is, gets this more often than other dogs is the miniature schnauzer. And as long as they have deep pain, they usually recover, but it can take months. Treatment is purely supportive. Steroids do not help these guys. I do not give them steroids. Um, I usually don't put them on anything unless the owner is still not convinced that their dog is not painful. I, ha you know, I don't have a problem putting them on something like gabapentin for pain, um, but most of the time the owners are fine with them being on nothing. Um, physical therapy can help speed up their recovery. And this is that dog two months later. So you can see he's not completely normal, but he's a lot better than, than he was when he came in. Well, I've never seen it reoccur in the same dog.
So the clients, yeah, I get asked that a lot. I've never seen one happen again in the same dog. And then this is our schnauzer with it. So the asymmetrical paresis. This is the next case. This was a 10-month-old female spade shizu that presented for a two-month history of intermittent weakness. The, basically, the owner came in and said, um, my dog seems like it cannot walk at times. The owner did not think this dog was painful at home. She had been seen um, by her primary veterinarian, had had blood work, it was normal. She had been treated with an NSAID. The owner did not report seeing any improvement. Here's part of her exam. Her mentation was very normal. She was a pretty happy little dog, but she was weak. Her proprioception, if you held her up, was normal, although she had a hard time standing for any period of time. But if you stood her up, she, you tried to turn her feet under, she knew where her feet were. And the other big thing about this dog was there was no pain anywhere that I could find. Um, she had normal reflexes other than her palpebral was a little weak. Where would we localize this dog? This dog could have been potentially a myopathy, um, although they usually aren't that weak. So my top suspicion was this dog had neuromuscular disease, specifically myasthenia gravis. So again, a, a myopathy could present with similar signs. Oftentimes, if this dog is coming to you, you know, you're going to want to do blood work and make sure there's not something metabolic going on, some electrolyte abnormality, but most of the time, by the time they get to me, they've already had that stuff done, so I don't have to really think about that stuff, but when you're the first person seeing this dog, you certainly would want to do routine blood work and make sure there's not something systemic going on. Because of our suspicion for myasthenia gravis, we sent out the test for that, which is um, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And this dog's titer was almost five. Anything above 0.6 is considered positive. So this dog had a really high titer. It doesn't always correlate to the severity of disease, but it concerned me when I saw how high this was. At that time, I did not know the owner declined any further diagnostics. So myasthenia gravis is basically the failure of neurotransmission at the neuromuscular junction due to a lack of functional receptors. And that can be from antibodies on the receptors, or it can be that there's actually a lack of receptors, um, as in a congenital form. The hallmark of something like this is going to be weakness, usually associated with exercise. Um, so these guys can come in looking normal initially and then get weaker the more that they do, depending on if Certain other things are affected, like the esophagus. They may have a complaint of vomiting or regurgitation, sometimes a voice change. These guys may have a hoarse bark or a weak bark. That may be something that the owner picks up on. And then facial weakness. You can see it's much more um, common in people with myasthenia gravis. And often the pelvic limbs seem to be more affected than the forelimbs. And the two forms are congenital or acquired. And with acquired, there can be different clinical forms. We can see a focal form that just involves the pharynx or the esophagus, and these animals will not have any obvious weakness. The generalized form is the most common. So these are the animals that do have weakness. Again, may seem to affect the pelvic limbs more than the thoracic. Megasophagus is unfortunately very common in dogs um, with this. Cats, not as much, just because of the difference in striated versus smooth muscle in their esophagus. So majority of dogs are going to have megasophagus, which is the main thing that affects their prognosis. And then we can see an acute fulminating kind, where these animals come in with really severe weakness. These are the ones that may have proprioceptive deficits, um, and the prognosis for these is, is really poor. I've not had one of these make it out of the hospital. The congenital form is extremely rare. These animals show symptoms from the time they start to walk. They, they just lack the receptors. So they'll, they'll never be normal. So this is not a dog that was normal and then becomes weak. These are dogs that they're never, they've never been normal. They typically don't have a megasophagus. So the acquired is much more common. And these are due to antibodies that are actually formed and directed against the acetylcholine receptor. Any breed can be affected. There's some that are reported a little bit more often, and it tends to occur in young and old dogs. So there's kind of two main ages that we see this in. So dogs as young as four months um, can get this.
the diagnosis is made by sending out the test for the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. We can do a Tensilon test, like you saw in that dog in the earlier video. Um, that is not definitive. There can be false positives and even false negatives. If they have the more acute form, they often don't respond to Tensilon. The only definitive test is the antibody test. Unless it's congenital, then they don't have antibodies, and the only way to confirm that is with a muscle biopsy. Treatment is mainly the anticholinesterase therapy. So what that does is it just allows acetylcholine to hang around in the junction longer and find an available receptor. Most dogs do well with just that as their treatment. If they don't respond to that alone, then they'll add in an immunosuppressive drug. Um, you just have to be careful because a lot of these guys do have megasophagus and they're prone to pneumonia. And so it just makes it a little bit harder to put them on um, something like steroids. Some of these dogs can have a thymoma, and if they do, then thymectomy is um, recommended. And then the rest of the care is supportive. These guys often need, if they have a megasophagus, upright feedings. This is a Bailey chair that a client made and donated to the hospital. It really depends on, in my experience, whether or not they have a megasophagus. If they have a megasophagus, they usually end up either being euthanized or dying of pneumonia within a few months of diagnosis, most of these guys, because um, the megasophagus is not reversible. Even once you treat them, that's permanent. So if they don't have megasophagus, I have seen them do well, do really well. Um, and there is even the possibility that they can go into a spontaneous remission and come off of medication. This is that same dog I showed you earlier. This was her first recheck appointment. She'd been on Mestinon. And at this point, she'd had radiographs taken. There was no sign of a megasophagus. And the owner reported that there were no signs of weakness at home, that she could run and play. and. Um, they hadn't noticed any problems. So I don't think it's been long enough that we've rechecked the titer. I'll usually recheck a titer in four to six months on these guys and see if they're, you know, have any change in their titer um, and just make sure they're not going into remission. I would check it again a month later and make sure it's still normal and then wean them off of the medication. This is a 10-month-old Yorkie that presented to our hospital for weakness. The owner did report that this dog had been dropped a few months prior, um, but they said there had been no symptoms that they had seen immediately after that happened. But a few weeks prior to coming in here, the owner reported the dog seemed weak in the back right leg. It had had x-rays of that leg um, with no abnormal findings, had been treated with an NSAID, and, but it didn't seem to help and the weakness then progressed to involving the forelimbs and the owner reported the dog seemed ataxic. He also, at the time of presentation, they reported a decreased appetite. So neuro exam showed a normal mentation, but the dog seemed to not want to turn its head to the left. When he was walking, he had a generalized ataxia and would lean to the left, but would only turn to the right. Proprioception was decreased in both forelimbs and mildly decreased in the left rear, but normal in the right rear. The dog had normal reflexes and was painful with cranial cervical palpation. So this dog was localized to a C15 lesion. This is a young Yorkie. Our top differential was an atlantoaxial subluxation. Meningitis, myelitis were also considerations as well as syringomyelia in a young dog like this. Um, the dog had a history of trauma, so that was something that was still considered. Um, disco, this would be an unusual breed um, to see that in, but that's possible as well. And then, of course, neoplasia, unlikely in this young a dog, but possible. So based on the differentials, the um, recommendation was to perform x-rays. They were done with the dog awake. So we usually start with them awake. If we can't good, get good radiographs, we might have to sedate them. But this dog <coughs> had an atlantoaxial subluxation. So we see C1 up here and C2, they should be in alignment. So Yorkies are the most common breed to get atlantoaxial subluxation. Usually they present before the age of two, although sometimes they don't present until they're older. 
I've seen it in a five, six-year-old dog that was asymptomatic until something minor happened, and then they became clinical, like they, someone stepped on the dog or it fell off the couch. Um, but they usually present under the age of two. Signs can be intermittent. They can be painful or not. Um, they can be ataxic. Treatment is usually surgery, unless for some reason surgery is not an option, whether they have concurrent medical problems or financially they can't afford um, surgery. If that's the case, then medical treatment consists of putting these guys in a neck brace um, like this one. So the neck brace, in order to completely immobilize that C12 joint, has to come up over the head, and then we usually you don't have to bring it back quite that far, but usually bring it past the front legs. We make these out of typically casting material that will just um, kind of mold to the top of the dog's head and back along its back with the dog's head in a neutral position and then wrap it with bandage material. So you want something a little bit um, rigid in there for these guys. If they're really, really tiny, you don't have to put anything in there. You can just make it out of bandage material. The worry is that with medical treatment, that once you take this brace off, we usually leave it on for eight to 10 weeks, that if there is any sort of trauma, that they can immediately go back to how they were. So they can do really well in the brace. It's just a worry about them long term. Sometimes it's not apparent on x-rays as to what's going on. And occasionally, we do have to do MRI of these guys or CT with MRI. The advantage is that we can see what's going on um, from a soft tissue standpoint, what's going on with the spinal cord, how compressed is it, is there a lot of edema there, and then oftentimes these guys can have concurrent neurologic problems. They can have hydrocephalus, they may have syringomyelia, and if they do end up undergoing surgery, once they've had surgery, they can't have an MRI any, at any point in their life once they have those metal implants there. So I don't recommend that they all get it. Um, it just depends on if there's anything else on their neuro exam or history that would make us suspicious there's a concurrent problem. So that little guy, he did have surgery. There's multiple ways that these can be fixed surgically. Just kind of depends on um, what you're comfortable with, how little these guys are, what kind of implants we can get in there. So this guy had surgery, and this was him the next day. He's still a little ataxic. It's a little hard to tell because he's so wiggly. He was happy. So this, this dog, it had, I think it was a few weeks from when we diagnosed him to when we could do the surgery. So we did put him in a neck brace in the, in the meantime. The owners, I think, said he was just so happy to be out of his neck brace. And then this was him at his two-week recheck. He was doing really well. So we're not out of the woods with this one yet. These guys need about eight to 10 weeks of really strict rest. I don't put them back in a neck brace after surgery. Some people will, but as long as they are really careful, they don't let this dog run around, jump on or off any furniture, they usually do fine without it. There is a company in Canada that's making these more permanent neck braces that if the dogs aren't candidates for surgery and they need a more long-term solution, um, you make a mold of them with casting material and send it, you end up cutting it off and sending it to them and then they make these neck braces that can be taken on and off um, so they can wear this long-term. I haven't done one yet, but we had a, a dog come in that had had one of these made at UT and it actually seemed to work pretty well. The next case is a nine-year-old male neutered Basenji mix. This dog presented for a left rear limb lameness of three to four months duration. The dog had been seen by multiple people. He'd been in even on our ER service, had rads of the limb, had been treated with rest, NSAIDs. Um, there was just no improvement. And so eventually he made his way to me. There was no um, explanation for this lameness. Most of the time with a lameness, we're usually going to look for something orthopedic first. But then when, sometimes when nothing can be found, then we start worrying, is this actually a neurologic problem? So when this guy presented, he was not ataxic, but he had a left rear limb lameness. And most of the time, he would just hold that leg up and walk on the other three. And he did have a um, proprioceptive deficit in that leg um, when I did his testing. Um, as well as a weak withdrawal. So based on the weak withdrawal, the decreased proprioception in that leg, I suspected a left-sided L4-S2 lesion, specifically a lesion of the left sciatic nerve.
one thing to point out is this guy had an increased patellar reflex in the left rear, which you would normally think of as seeing with a um, upper motor neuron lesion. Um, but occasionally, if you have a sciatic nerve deficit, then the patellar on that same side will be increased because you don't have the antagonism. So you'll get a pseudo, it's called a pseudo hyperreflexia. In this patient, when I see these guys, I hate to get tunnel vision, but to see something like this, my top differential is going to be a nerve sheet tumor. Um, we certainly can see lateralized IVDD, but to be that lateralized is really unusual. So unfortunately, before even doing any diagnostics on these, I tell these people that we're pretty much doing diagnostics to confirm a tumor and we hope that we're wrong and find something else, but most of the time these are going to be tumors. And um, MRI is definitely the modality of choice for looking for these. They can be hard to find. Um, this one was actually a little bit difficult to find. I mean, this, this is the tumor kind of tracking back. So this is the, the pelvis, the sacrum. This is L7. This is the lumbosacral space. This is a, a, a parasagittal image, so we're just off the left side um, of the, the spine, and back here is the pelvis, and these are the nerve roots, the thickened nerve roots coming off between L6-7 and L7-S1 back here, and then this is the tumor up here. This is a transverse or axial image. This is actually um, colon under here, so this is the top of the dog's back. So this one, we could find it, but some of them are, are small and they are hard hard to find. These are typically seen in mature dogs, usually large breeds. They can involve the forelimb or the rear limb. They are sometimes painful, but I see a lot of these dogs that don't have obvious signs of pain. And they oftentimes don't have proprioceptive deficits until later in the course of disease. So it, it can be really tough to figure out that these are neurologic versus orthopedic. Unfortunately for these guys, the prognosis is, is pretty poor. Um, so even with surgery, the time to reoccurrence um, is pretty quick. Usually much less than a year, these are coming back. With the, when they're involving a nerve of the forelimb, amputation um, with excision of nerve roots is usually the treatment. If it's involving a rear limb, it often involves a hemipelvectomy as well as the amputation. Um, a treatment that's not, I'd say, been used as often is radiation, and there's actually been some reports that these guys can do better with radiation than surgery and have closer to a year before recurrence. They don't usually have return of function of the limb, so if they get radiation, that's a big thing to explain to people is, you know, it doesn't usually lead to a ton of improvement, it just slows down the disease. And chemotherapy is rarely done. It's not thought to really help these guys. This is two more examples of ones that were a little bit more obvious. This is a, the dog's head is up here. We're looking down on the dog. This is a dorsal image. This is after contrast. And these two nerve roots coming off between C, I think this was C12 and 23 were really thickened and then kind of joined together. And then this is one back in the pelvic limb again. This is the spinal cord coming down. The pelvis you can see a little bit of. And this is after contrast. This right here and here are the, the really big nerves coming off of the spinal cord. All right, this is a, I, I realized when I put this talk together, I didn't mean for it to have a lot of boxers in here, but somehow it did. <laughs> um, this is a six-month-old female boxer who presented to me for a two-month history of pain, decreased appetite, a stiff gait, and an arched back. The dog had been seen a few times um, by its veterinarian. It had had radiographs taken um, when the sign started, and then again about a month prior to seeing me. The radiographs were normal both times. The dog was treated with an NSAID. Um, not much improvement was seen, so the dog presented. The dog's general physical exam, including its TPR, was normal. On neurologic exam, <clears throat> this dog um, did not appear ataxic, but was stiff in the rear and just had a normal stance, or a narrow stance. And he was painful with palpation of the mid lumbar spine. So this dog localized to T3L3. Remember, this dog is six months old, so differentials were 
discospondylitis, neoplasia, and meningitis were, were the big ones. There was no history of trauma in this dog, but it, it did live on a, um, a lot of acreage, and the owner had some horses and I think cattle as well. Um, so it was something still we, we considered, although nothing was seen on previous rads. But because this dog was so young, I wasn't suspicious of something like a disc herniation. Um, I recommended repeating rads one more time just to make sure there wasn't a lesion that we could see that just wasn't apparent on previous x-rays. So we radiographed this dog and between L3-4 you can see the M plates are very irregular. Here's a close-up of it. So this dog had discospondylitis. And like I said, this dog had been radiographed twice before. I, I saw the radiographs. They were normal. Um, and one of the sets of radiographs had been taken a month into this, to this dog being clinical. So that's the, the big take-home message for me with DISCO is the radiographic signs can really lag behind clinical signs by up to eight weeks. So if you're really suspicious of something like this, sometimes just keep repeating radiographs um, to see if it shows up. These are usually large breed dogs um, and they're painful. These are some of the most painful dogs that I ever see. So that's a, a big hallmark is they're going to be painful. Um, sometimes they have pretty significant uh, muscle atrophy um, locally where the lesion is. And depending on how severe the lesion is, they can have some proprioceptive deficits and they occasionally present completely down. It's Usually due to a bacterial infection, staph and strep are the most common. We occasionally see this due to fungal organisms. I'm always suspicious if I see this in a German Shepherd that it's fungal. Um, they tend to be predisposed to fungal over bacterial. Most of the time we don't know where this infection comes from. Um, we certainly can see it with direct contamination like bite wounds or even post-surgery. Um, that's pretty rare. Um, most of the time we don't know where it came from. Once you do have a diagnosis, which is usually made on radiographs, then treatment is usually a pretty long course of antibiotics. I usually recommend cultures of urine and blood, but with urine they're positive about a quarter of the time. Blood's a little bit higher percentage, so you a lot of times don't have a culture to go on, so you want to treat um, with a fairly broad spectrum antibiotic or one that gets the most common agents. If I have a client that's um, really money conscious, I've, I've treated lots of these dogs with cephalexin and that'll get about 80% of them. So there is still a percentage that it's not going to treat, um, but it'll treat a lot of them. And these guys are, I mean, they're on antibiotics for months, so I mean, Clavamox, Batrol is going to be really expensive. Um, I've treated a lot of these guys with Simplicef, um, and they've done really well, and that's usually less expensive than, than Clavamox. Occasionally, if they're not responding to treatment, we've gone in and got a culture from the disc space, but that's, that's rarely needed. That's if they're not responding. So do you normally do a fungal on the German Shepherds? If it's a German Shepherd, always. Yep. Uh, yep, the Maravista. Yep. If it's another breed, I usually don't unless they're just not responding. I'd say most of them I treat with cephalexin or Simplicef. And then usually I'll recommend repeating rads every six to eight weeks to monitor these guys. And you oftentimes are gonna expect them to look worse radiographically, even though clinically they're doing better. So this was, this was two months later. And then by three and a half months later, we can see it's fusing here. And then five months later, you see continued fusion. So at this point, this looks pretty quiet. This doesn't look like an active lesion. We don't have continued lysis. I'm usually pretty cautious with these guys and we'll continue to treat them um, sometimes longer, but there's even a change from five months to seven months. So if we're still seeing changes on x-rays, I'll continue to treat them until I see two sets of x-rays that, that look the same. Our next case, we're almost done. This is a 10-year-old boxer, male neutered, who presented for a few month history of seizures. This dog had been started on zonismide, I believe after he had maybe two seizures, and the owner reported that the dog was otherwise normal. They didn't notice any changes in its behavior at home. Um, and the only reason they actually brought the dog in was it had had two pretty violent seizures that were a little worse than previous ones and the post-dictal phase was, was lasting quite a while. So they ended up bringing this dog in. 
Neurologically, this dog looked pretty normal. He had an inconsistent proprioceptive deficit in both rear legs, um, but mentation was normal, his gait was normal. But we know this dog has a forebrain lesion. He's got seizures, differentials for this dog. He's 10 years old and he's a boxer. Are pretty much going to breed tumor until proven otherwise. Um, it's always you know, possible we could be dealing with some sort of infection or inflammatory disease, possibly a stroke that then predisposes this dog to having future seizures. Or in an older dog, if you don't find anything, we have this term cryptogenic epilepsy, meaning you know, it's not, doesn't fit with idiopathic, but we don't have a reason for these seizures. So we recommended an MRI, and this guy had this tumor here. So this is a probable glioma, so it's in the brain. Brachycephalics are more prone to these than any other breed. When it comes to brain tumors in dogs, they have quite a high incidence compared to, to, to us and cats. So unfortunately, we, we see a lot of brain tumors in dogs. The symptoms really depend on the part of the brain that's affected. If it's in the forebrain, then seizures are the most common sign. If it's in the brain stem, which is, we don't see brain tumors there nearly as commonly as in the forebrain, but if we do, then you're gonna see usually vestibular type signs. Gliomas specifically, again, tend to affect brachycephalic breeds more than other, and these tend to occur at a younger age. So that boxer was 10, but I'll say, I see these more often in five, six-year-old dogs. Um, so if I have a five-year-old boxer with seizures, I'm still gonna be really worried about this. Treatment is either palliative, which would be steroids and anticonvulsants. Um, surgery is an option for these guys sometimes, but because these tumors are in the brain, surgery is definitely not gonna cure these guys or, or often get all of the tumor. It's more debulking. Um, radiation is an option for these. Um, there's traditional fractionated radiation, which is done over three, four weeks, or stereotactic radiation, which is one to three treatments. Um, that's done in a row. And the prognosis with radiation is uh, average survival is around a year, a little bit less. And then chemotherapy can also be used for these guys. But these, these tend to be a little bit more aggressive tumors, and the overall prognosis is still pretty poor, even in people. Um, I believe the survival times are, are really dismal for, for these tumors. There is actually a clinical trial that just started at Mississippi State, and that's actually where these people took this dog. Um, they're doing a clinical trial that involves surgery, so they're going in and debulking these tumors, and then they are injecting into the tumor site an oncolytic virus against these. So they're working with the UAB Medical School um, and I believe the same trial is going on in people. So they're comparing because these tumors are very similar to what, what people get. So this is this dog, I believe a few days post-op. He was still at Mississippi State. Um, he's at home now. The owners report he's doing really well. But I mean the trial just started last month so we don't have any out really, you know, long-term outcomes yet to know if this is going to make a difference for these guys. All right, this will be our last one. This is an 11-year-old female spade shepherd mix who had presented to me for abnormal behavior of several months, which the owner described as the dog walking in circles, although she said it didn't seem to be to one side or the other. She was pacing, walking into corners, didn't really seem to respond to her name anymore, had a decreased appetite. The owner had been hand feeding this dog and giving her water by syringe for a month when she came in. So she would not drink at all. This dog had actually been diagnosed with Cushing's two years prior to this and had been treated with trilostane and then became an Addisonian. And so when I saw her, she'd actually been off of trilostane for a year. She also had a history of pretty severely elevated liver enzymes, which was actually thought to be potentially unrelated to her Cushing's. So she'd been seen for that several times. A neurologic exam showed very demented dog. Um, this dog just paced in the exam room. She sometimes would just head press. She did not seem to respond to anything around her. She was not ataxic and had actually normal proprioception. But based on this dog's signs of the pacing, the demented mentation, a forebrain lesion was suspected. My big differentials for this dog were a tumor or cognitive dysfunction. I've seen some of these guys with cognitive dysfunction that have looked really bad, and this had been going on for months, so that was actually still a pretty big differential for this dog.
And then something like hepatic encephalopathy based on her history was also a consideration. So an, we recommended an MRI and this dog had a pituitary macro um, adenoma. This tumor was almost half the height of this dog's brain and this dog had never had a seizure. This dog had no proprioceptive deficits. Um, you can see it, this is a lateral or sagittal view, how big this is. And here's a normal pituitary for a comparison. Um, so one of the, the big things I would say with these ones with pituitary tumors, they don't follow the rules of other brain tumors in that they rarely have seizures. Um, they, they don't often present as demented as this dog did, but they just come in for kind of subtle or nonspecific signs. They, they don't want to eat. They just seem a little off to the owner. Most of the tumors are functional, but they can be non-functional, so they don't always have Cushing's um, when they have these. They're considered a macro adenoma if they're greater than a centimeter on imaging. So again, the, the symptoms can be sometimes pretty nonspecific. I'd say lethargy, anorexia are big ones. They, we don't see a lot of blindness with these just because of the, where these are located compared to in people. They're actually not very close to the optic nerves or optic chiasm versus in, in people with pituitary tumors. One of the more common symptoms is blindness because it presses on their optic chiasm. But in dogs, we don't see that, although people will report they feel like their dog can't see well, but then on exam, they often still have a normal menace. I think it's more of a cognitive issue, um, not so much truly a visual problem. And then they can have seizures, but that, it's not actually common. These guys are the one brain tumor that can actually do really well with radiation. So most brain tumors with radiation, survival time's about a year. Um, with these, it's, uh, survival times are between 750 and 1400 days. So they, they can do quite well and they can have a really big improvement in their symptoms with radiation. Surgery can be done, although I believe when they get to be as big as this dog, surgery is not an option. But the only place I currently know of that actually does this surgery um, is Washington State. This is this dog a month after radiation. The owner decided to go do radiation. She actually did stereotactic radiation up in Ohio where she had three treatments, so it was three days in a row. She, she has a lameness. She had a chronic lameness. I don't remember the etiology of that, but this dog still looked a little demented to me, but this dog actually was following me around and responding to her name. And the first time this dog came in, she didn't know where she was. Um, like I said, she, she didn't respond to her name. She had pressed in the corner the whole time. So this dog's not normal, but, and these will often improve for several months after radiation. It takes time to see the full um, response. But this owner was ecstatic. She's like, I have my dog back. She responds to me. She plays with me. She was eating. She was no longer being ha hand fed. They usually have no side effects from the radiation. They usually do really well. Stereotactic radiation is $9,000. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the downside to it. So the majority of these dogs still remain, if they are cushionoid, they still remain cushionoid. Potentially this dog would maybe need to go back on um, treatment at some point if she becomes clinical. Um, I think it's only a small percentage where it has enough effect on the pituitary that they don't need to be treated for their Cushing's. But yeah, I don't know of any reports of them having other like endocrine issues because of it. All right, we'll stop there. Any questions? All right.